Good morning. Uh, my name is Barry Vogel with uh, ALTI, that is the Audio and Loudspeaker Technologies International Association. And we are pleased to present uh, a webinar called Multiphysics Simulation and Low Frequency Horn Loudspeaker. Uh, and that's going to be presented today by uh, Dr. Albert Svobodnik, the president and CEO of the Envoid Group. Uh, we also have uh, Tommaso Nizzoli of the Envoy Group, Chief CAE Analyst, and uh, James Hipperson of Function One Research Limited. And uh, of course, I wanted to let you know that uh, this is meant to be a, a small primer event for our main event. That's our live uh, Alti Expo 2021 that will be happening this year, October 24th and 25th at uh, the Doubletree in Orlando, Florida, just before Infocom. Uh, it's our 60th anniversary, so we are going to put on a show, and we hope to see all of you there. Everyone's getting back to business and getting back out again, so we're going to be very happy to have you all there. And uh, I am going to release my screen now, and I'm going to let uh, uh, the, the people, the presenters here, take this over. All right. Thank you very much, Barry, for your introduction. Um, so I'm going to um, guide through our, our, our presentations about uh, base horns. Alfred, it, I, I apologize. May I interrupt yeah. you for one moment? I forgot, sure. to tell, I forgot to tell everybody at the bottom of your screen, if you have questions, uh, enter your questions in the Q&A. And uh, our team here will be happy to answer them later on. Uh, any of the, uh, any, any of the um, uh, you can use the chat screen at the, at the left of your screen if you'd like to have conversations amongst yourself or just introduce yourself. But the Q&A is at the bottom of your screen. I'm sorry, Alfred, back to you. No problem. Um, so let's restart now. <laughs> Any comments, Barry? <laughs> uh, no, that's very important, the, the, the Q&A function. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we're, we're doing this um, in that style, so that you have the opportunity to ask questions. And uh, I mean, it's really a great pleasure today to have a joint presentation with, with one of our customers, uh, Function One, represented by James Hipperson, because I think the important um, aspect here, specifically in terms of Alti, is really to give you a practical application of simulations. I mean, there are many presentations about simulations where you might be asking yourself, well, and what can I do with it? And we really would like to focus here on, on the practical aspects. Why do we do it? How can it be used? And, uh, and, and James is the, I mean, the perfect guy to make a connection between the virtual domain, what is our domain, I mean, Tomas's and, and my domain, um, and the and function one's domains in the real world. I mean, rolling out the products, delivering hardware and delivering sound to the um, to the end users. Also, I'd like to to mention Philip here as a contributor specifically in terms of um, of CAT functions here. So. What we are trying um, to show you here um, in that in that presentation, um, sorry, um, is is a quick introduction focusing on the topic. What is a base horn? It's a very very specific and unique design, um, and, and and James is going to explain to you um, a little bit about the the basics and the the, the background, and also about history. That's quite interesting. Um, and then I will I will explain a little bit the idea of a of a functional digital mockup, and and the whole approach of a of a simulation um, driven design um, paradigm here, and specifically Tommaso will then take over and, and and show you interactively how how the model looks like in the in the software packages that we use, so that you have a, a really better feeling and understanding. How, how easy it is to work with. Um, and, and finally, we'll talk about, about results, um, post-processing and, and specifically validation, um, which is always, I think, an, an important aspect. Um, yeah, I will, um, I will then um, move over um, to James. I mean, I will share my screen um, and, and I will assist James then while he goes um, through his interesting thoughts about them, uh, base horns. Cool, thanks, Alfred. Um, so a quick history lesson for anyone that may not be familiar with what base horns are or how they work. 
Um, it, it's not a new idea. Uh, it's been around from the beginning, essentially, out of the necessity that in the beginning of loudspeakers, there was very little amplifier power available. So in order to deliver low frequencies to a large audience, you needed to maximize the electroacoustic efficiency of the loudspeaker as much as you possibly could. Uh, and there are numerous early examples of that uh, by Bell Labs, Western Electric, uh, Clang Film in Germany in the 30s and the 40s. Um, it continued, they continued to be used all the way through the 20th century um, up till the, the late 60s, 70s, JBL and Altec were doing um, uh, rear loaded horns as you can see diagrammatically on the on the left here and uh, what we're going to be talking about and what we still develop today at function one is is, is called a folded front loaded horn uh, and there's there's three schematic examples of, of that there so this, the second one is a w bin because the sound channel is essentially w shaped uh, a front loaded horn um, which is like a c-shaped um, quite a large long horn horn path uh, and finally the the type of bass horn that we're going to be simulating in this presentation and uh, and these various types of, of, of front loaded horns were independently developed by a few different people uh, in the early 1970s um, so if we move on to the next one next slide please thank you um, so we, we've been doing this for a very long time, not me personally, of course, but our founder, Tony Andrews, uh, we've got a couple of picture on the left here from the early 1970s with uh, a JBL biradial mid and high horns. And the, the purple horns at the bottom are an early dual 15 inch folded horn um, and some phase linear amplifiers there that you can see, which, uh, which do about 200 watts um, into eight ohms. So very little power um to, to use there uh, then uh, in the middle uh, we've got a further development the smaller bass horns you can see are sort of kind of looking schematically similar to what we do at function one now uh, in and then in the center is uh, a pyramid type horn for a 30 inch ev driver uh, and then finally on the right we have the first 21 inch loudspeaker ever made um, in 1985 the TSW721 uh, actually had to, to build their own magnetizer to, to magnetize the ferrite on that. Um, and since then, we've, we've continued to, to develop um, this, this style of bass horn uh, up to the present day, uh, and we're still using them, as, as you'll see on the next slide. Sorry, Tony Andrews uh, was the guy that invented this, may not have said that. So, Starting in 2000, um, uh, is an, uh, the, the first Function One bass horn product, which is a very compact dual 18 inch bass horn um, with, with very high output. Um, in, in 2006, we've refined that with a new 21 inch driver, neodymium 21 inch, inch driver, and that's what we're gonna be looking at modeling in this presentation um, with, with higher sensitivity and, and went a bit deeper. Uh, in 2015, um, we went a bit crazy with the, the power soft linear motor, which is very interesting. It's a, it's a static ribbon voice coil with a moving neodymium um, magnet on a, on a shaft. And we, we designed a carbon fiber cone for that, for very low frequencies. Uh, and most recently, a 24 inch driver and horn um, with, with dual six inch voice coils, um, which is a bit smaller, but, but goes a bit deeper. Um, and all of these, our design process is typically quite a long empirical design process of testing prototypes because in the very beginning in the 70s you, you just you, we couldn't do simulation um you know unless you're the the military or something like that um and early attempts at simulation weren't weren't particularly accurate enough to be more useful than just building it and spending the time finding out um but the problem that we that we've got now that um that, that was the motivation for this and, and the reason why we're developing this now is that it's really useful to be able to predict uh, the coverage and directivity of arrays of, of base horns and um, typically you do this with a point source model but this the which is quite good at predicting a surprising amount of stuff despite its simplicity but um, there's, there's a number of things that a point source model won't predict um, 
And as you may be aware, that uh, you, you can't really measure subwoofers in an anechoic chamber because it would have to be prohibitively large um, to, to get the, the low frequency response. Um, so you're only left with sort of putting things out in a field, which also comes with its own problems. So simulation becomes um, a, a really attractive solution here. And that's what we're going to look at. And um, I didn't mention, I mentioned briefly about the efficiency, but yeah, we've, we've stuck with the, the horn because, because of the, the very high efficiency that you get from it. And um, also the, the subjective audio quality we think of horns is um, is really nice and really exciting. So it's it's worth it, we think. So I'm going to hand back over to Alfred now, and we're going to we're going to look at how we how we did some simulation of the 21 inch bass horn. Yeah, thank you very much for that um, interesting introduction about about bass horns. I I mean, looking here at this sensitive sensitivity number, it's fantastic. I mean, 107 dB that that's really loud. I'm just I should mention that these are those are half space sensitivities because we put subs on the ground. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's st still a good number. <laughs> yeah. I mean, usually we have a ground <laughs> if you go to a concert. Yes. So, um, uh, so I'm really surprised that you want to work on an on an array, but um, anyway, I mean, there there hopefully in the near future there will be again really you know big audiences listening to concerts, and then we we really need that that interesting design. So. I mean, I, 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 not only did I really like the idea, in, uh, I mean, from a physical point of view um, of bass horns, um, it's very clear here, the challenge, the main challenge is really to, to have a good predict, prediction for the interaction between the transducer and the enclosure. And there is an extreme sensitivity, I would say here with that, with that design. Um, later, Tomasa will also, also show that you can actually see the loading of the baffle. So when you put it on the floor, um, you get um, um, kind of kind of loading from the um, from the baffle and from the reflections that you re can really see on the um, on on the transducer. So that is is you know a sign that you need a very very good coupling. And um, we of course call this a um, a multiphysics coupling in a bidirectional way. So um, um, a, a strong coupling effect here. Um, but before in Really going into some simulation details, I, I really would like to um, to mention our our approach here. Um, um, really looking at the at the development cycle, and and I mean James he, he introduced one of the um, um, you know the the fact why they're just started now using simulations was simply in the past the accuracy was not available, and 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 also you know um, if. It's also about um, time and efficiency. Um, not everything makes sense to simulate. If you're faster um, with your prototypes, physical prototypes, um, then there's not much justification. But the idea really of, um, of virtual prototyping is definitely um, to speed up the, the development cycle. And, and I think this is a, specific, a very interesting application case here. Um, because, um, I mean, the challenge is not only in, in delivering a physical prototype, but also doing the measurement. That's not, that's not really um, easy and straightforward because as James pointed out, you cannot do it in an anechoic chamber. So we really need to go into, into the field. So, and that's also a, a, a quite, quite a tricky thing to do. So what I'm, I'm trying to do here is, is here really to show you um, the, the, the main difference between a conventional product development process that you can see in the upper area here, um, where we start with the concept and industrial design, um, um, which might end up I mean, in, in a product specification. And then we go into the design and product development phase to realize this product um, um, specification. So with the transducer, um, mechanics, the hardware, software, and so on. And then we start building um, some physical prototypes and then it gives the system engineer for the very first time an audio experience that you can listen to it or or, 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 or make measurements on that so that you can finally then do um, your product validation if it it's the product doesn't match the specification then you're iterating here um, until you really can go into the industrialization phase i mean into manufacturing and um, start of production here what we are approaching here is 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 really a different mindset um, in terms of the uh, of the development process. 
So we claim here that you should start as early as possible um, with simulations. Um, and we use a, um, a term here because, um, you know, we're talking about the digital mockup and, and digital mockup, I mean, DMU, this is, this is often used, but here we're really talking about the functional DMU. And what is the function here? The core function of this is, is a loudspeaker. So it, it needs to um, generate sound out of an electrical signal. So it's, it's electroacoustics. This is the, the main function here. And we're looking at this as a main function. There might be a couple of other um, interesting things that, uh, that you would simulate here later in the design phase, you know, I mean, the mechanical and fatigue stress issues. So for example, might also be interesting, but I, I would say this is the main function is really in terms of electroacoustics. So um, we're gonna show you here um, how we do in an electroacoustics DMU um, that really gives us some um, quite soon in the, in the development process, actually right in the concept phase, um, a, um, a, a virtual prototype that we call the digital reference because we use that for the product specification. You know, product specification, not in a, in, in a traditional way that we have some numbers. No, it's really um, a 3D model with electroacoustics. So it really describes um, the, the basic design of the, um, of the product. Um, and it leaves out um, some, some details which can be added later um, when we go into the industrialization phase and these details, you know, these might be mechanical requirements, um, um, everything beyond electroacoustics, I would say, and probably also some, some, some more details um, that might have an, probably not a major, but uh, a minor impact on the, on the sound reproduction here. And also uh, one thing that we can, can mention here is, is, is not, not only, the visualization of, um, of, of acoustics here, but we also have the capability um, to, to do an oralization and to listen to it. Um, just for, for the, the sub here, I think it, it's not so interesting because of the limited bandwidth. The oralization wouldn't be um, um, really interesting here, but actually you could mix it up with a full system. Um, I mean, in, in what we have seen before, I mean, really showing all the, the other channels also to give a, uh, a full bandwidth contribution here. So, and what we're gonna show you here is, is how we build up the digital reference. Um, and we have done this here um, of an existing product because we wanted to demonstrate the validation of the simulation model. But actually what we'd like to show you here is, is how we would do that if it really would be the development of a, of a new product and how we're gonna start that. So let's go a little bit into, into the physics here uh, and, and, and a, more, a more detailed look at the, at the virtual development process. Um, so you can see here on the, on the left side that we really start um, actually with the functional DMU, which is a simulation model um, and, and includes all the essential that we need for, um, for the digital reference. Here in, in, in that case, it's a, it's a loudspeaker, it's a single loudspeaker at the moment. So um, what we need to model is, is and, and, and this is a, a tier level concept that we have in our simulation method included um, that starts with a transducer and then you know, builds up um, to, a, um, to a loudspeaker by including a, an enclosure. And then, I mean, you can use that loudspeaker um, to simulate the radiation into a room or in free air um, and you can also um, include the arrays here. Um, and then everything can be, can be tuned and, and oralized. And also later, I mean, for the full product validation, um, we also have a tier level six, six a, um, a physical testing um, facility here. So um, mainly this is, um, this is really um, um, a, uh, a multi-physics model um, of, a, um, of a loudspeaker. So we're gonna focus here on tier level one and tier level two. Um, um, for this project. So we're gonna show you how we are simulating then the loudspeakers in a, in a, um, um, in a half space, in a two pi half space. So, well, what, what about the myth of a, of a DMU? It's actually, I would say um, a, a reduced um, cat mall. And I say reduced because it focuses on the core geometry that we need 
to describe the, the main electroacoustic properties of our product here. So here you can see actually um, on the on the right hand side, which is a um, a screenshot of the um, of the full blown cat model, and it, it shows all the the details and mechanical details, of course, that are required. I mean, really to to build the product and roll it out. While on the left hand side, it actually shows you um, the, the the functional mockup. And I mean, in the core, you can see the um, the two two transducers. I've added some transparency so that you can really see some of the details. And if you look a little bit closer, you can see that not all of the um, of the of the panels here are are being modeled like like these panels here on the right hand side with these um, holes here they're here just for mechanical reasons in in a, in our digital reference we're excluding at the moment the elastic effects that we might get from the enclosure so we're assuming the the enclosure is a rigid enclosure so we don't um, have to mold this um, the stiffening elements here. And, and also important is, is also to mention here that actually we are modeling the inverse of, of the product because um, when we assume that the, um, that the enclosure is rigid, we don't really have to model it. We just need to model the boundaries um, of the enclosure. What we need really to model is the air, the airspace, I mean, um, around the, the transducer. Um, back chamber, but also front chamber. I mean, the, 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 full, the whole front loading um, of, the, of the mall and then also the, the, the radiation here. So, but also in the, in the functional DMU, DMU we, we use a standard CAT system. In that case, it was SolidWorks um, to, to build up this functional DMU. It's simply, uh, I would say a different um, purpose, but um, you can do this with every um, more or less advanced 3D CAT mall. Important here is also to understand that this geometry description here is then bidirectionally linked um, to the to the simulation model. So that means when you are doing iterations to make improvements or even um, optimization. So recently we, we started really focusing on optimization. It's quite interesting um, to to do the um, the computer let the computer do the work in terms of um, optimization any any engineering targets you might have in mind here um, then you need this bidirectional um, associativity so this simply means that all the parameters that you have defined in your cat model are also available in the simulation um, and then you can change these parameters either manually or by an optimization algorithm and once you have your, your final geometry you have actually at the same time the final uh, geometry in the CAT system, and then you can really move on to the design and development phase and do all the, the, the mechanical um, engineering CAT-based work that needs to be done. Um, the, so when I say uh, a functional DMU for electroacoustic, that, that means we have to include only the components and subcomponents that are relevant for electroacoustic. And these are, of course, the transducer. We have a, a very specific approach to, to, to transducer modeling, um, specifically coupling 1D and, and, and 3D subsystems here. Um, I mean, usually at, at, at that stage, we don't really do any, any um, detailed um, electromagnetic design. Um, we would assume a, a standard design and would describe the, the electromagnetics by a set of tiddly small parameters. And these are, are based on equations. Um, as introduced in the in the simulation model. So this is really 1D, um, a typical lump parameter model based on equations. Then the <coughs> these equations are actually coupled to the structural dynamics. So this is really the, and, and that simplified first approach, um, the, the cone of the loudspeaker, which is assumed as, as being rigid here. Um, so this is also one day. So we're we're actually applying a, a set of constraints to the moving parts, so that the can, cone can only move um, in um, in its axial direction here. Um, and we're doing this um, to get a surface that, that can be coupled to the to the surrounding air, that we get the proper acoustics um, um, coupling here. And that that's really important to understand this type of coupling because acoustics that needs to be modeled in three D quite obvious if you look at the geometry here, there's no way for a simplification. You really need to model the, the 3D airspace. Um, and in that case, we need a, a surface representation because we could not couple to a single point here. 
So even though we have a surface, mechanically it's constrained to 1D, but it can, can be coupled to the, to the 3D acoustic space. And as I said, um, 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 as we are, are working on a, on, a, on a digital reference first, um, we are assuming it's a, um, it's a rigid enclosure. Uh, so we have sound hard boundary conditions with some, some exceptions here. Um, I mean, like the, um, you can see here in the, in the rear cavity of the, of the speaker that they have applied some, some foam I mean, to, to reduce some cavity resonances that we would see at higher um, frequencies there. And they and also you can see a, a donut like structure here. Um, this is the um, just the 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 missing airspace that is occupied by the magnet because it, it reduces the volume here. Um, and that of course might have an impact on the reloading um, on the transducer. So it's um it's it's acoustically modeled as a as a rigid boundary condition, but um but not really uh, with any um, uh, electromagnetic behavior because that's in the, in the equation here. Um, yeah, and then what we, what we need to do is really to, to, um, to um, model the airspace um, before and behind the, uh, the transducer where we use, um, um, I mean, 3D acoustic elements. And um, um, as you can see here, um, we model all the whole near field and then we we have a the con we use the concept of a of a PML a perfectly matched layer, so this is like a, a thick outer hull um, of the near field that that can really um, simulate the um, the radiation to infinity, um, and this is not only you know a simplified boundary condition that you don't have any reflections on the surface, you can really use this to calculate the the far field. Um, 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 sound pressure, and that is what, what Tomasa will will show you then later, uh, where you can really very nicely, I mean, I mean, and efficiently generate um, um, directivity plots um, in 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 three D, and I mean all these these typical results for uh, loudspeaker engineers like direct directivity plots, polar plots, and and so on. Um, also, what you see here is 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 the the generic model, uh, which uh, um, shows you a four pi. So no baffle um, situation, but of course, usually you do, uh, as James pointed out, um, the measurements in a baffled situation, um, and and that is something that you know in the in this um, other models in the simulation model will then be tailored a little bit. So we have one um, cat model, which is based on four pi, and then in the simulation model, um, we can we can really change the. Uh, the model set up slightly so that we have a, a two pi horizontal and, and, and vertical situation here. All right, um, I would say let's move on to to Tommaso. So he will first um, um, show you um, 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 the the model. Um, it's a fully coupled multi-physical analysis that we're performing, and he's going to explain you some of the details here. And by the way, we use um, in that case Comsol. I mean, just a few words on, on our approach here. So, I mean, our approach is, is really to deliver a, a, a methodology and the workflow highly automated um, to run this type of simulation. Simulation that you can do in a few hours um, if you use our technology and our templates. Basically, what you have to do is really um, just to use your geometry and your transducers. Um, and then it's pretty straightforward to get results out of that. All right, so I'm gonna stop here screen sharing so that Tomaso can share his screen. Yes, thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so this is the functional DMU that uh, uh, Alfred mentioned. So it's, uh, um, it's simplified in a way which is uh, simulation ready, let's say. So you can really see that uh, um, some details from the um, from the um, from the CAD uh, from the original CAD, they were um, they were skipped. For example, uh, there is no voice coil, which is not needed at the moment because the uh, loudspeaker is assumed as a rigid piston with a lamp parameter model. So, uh, but uh, nonetheless, the the cone uh, the cone shape and the dust cap, uh, the surround shape. Um, and even the magnetics is, uh, is, uh, is uh, still uh, drawn with their uh, real uh, shapes. Um, so Alfred mentioned, for example, the magnetic circuit. 
So here on the on the rear side of the cone is uh, is modeled and uh, and uh, actually uh, no elements are applied in order to to detract volume from this uh, rear cavity. Uh, okay, so this is the uh, functional DMU which was developed uh, in uh, in SolidWorks, and you can see it's uh, let's say we can call it um, say as a generic application because. Uh, later, we'll see that um, this uh, little speaker can be then positioned. Uh, it was positioned actually um, in different arrangements. So it was positioned uh, uh, horizontal wise. So on the on the longer side uh, on the ground, and it was also positioned uh, vertical wise. So on the smaller side on on the ground, uh, in order to um, let's say have different uh, measurements and uh, measurements arrangements. Uh, yes, already Alfred explained about the, the PML um, domains, which are these uh, exterior field uh, domains to, to um, absorb outgoing uh, waves, pressure waves. So I'm going to um, switch now to, to console multiphysics, which have, we have used to, um, to model this, uh, this loudspeaker, uh, which actually um, our templates are based on um, to model such uh, electrodynamics loudspeakers. So you can actually see that um, in the geometry node, uh, it was imported the, the original uh, uh, DMU, which uh, you can see it's uh, the full model. Uh, but after some uh, few operation, you can see that it was uh, reduced. Um, so in this case, to the uh, arrangement with, uh, let's say, um, a baffle plane on the, on the XZ uh, plane, which is a baffle, which is the last speaker was positioned on, onto. And uh, also um, a symmetry plane. So uh, we take advantage of the symmetry of the loudspeaker itself to let's say, reduce the computation um, uh, size. So the, um, I can uh, quickly show um, how it's uh, set up. And Alfred really mentioned that uh, really um, quickly can really, uh, the engineer can really um, come to speed and uh, um, bring up to speed and solve this model uh, quite quickly by assigning these uh, uh, properties of uh, air, um, the piston domain, which actually is the, uh, the speaker which is, uh, which is moving. And after this uh, uh, simple selections and um, by applying the transducer parameters, because it's uh, based on a lamp parameter model uh, by the uh, TLS mode parameters, um, really um, then it's, um, there is a, quite a lot of automation. So the shell node is already assigned to. So there are uh, different uh, boundary conditions uh, which um, say excite the loudspeaker. So the force, uh, the electromagnetic force, the, um, the MMD, the, the added mass, uh, the stiffness, the KMS. So um, these are uh, readily automated. Um, and the pressure acoustics, the engineer needs to um, take care, for example, about, uh, yes, the gasket um, that doesn't need to, uh, let's say, um, there, there should be no leakage if it's an interior boundary. So actually this uh, uh, seals um, the uh, one cavity, the front cavity of the, the woofer and the cavity of the horn. Other um, boundary conditions, specific boundary conditions are, for example, the foam padding that uh, um, uh, was, made, was uh, uh, shown in the uh, presentation. So uh, this needs to be uh, stopped specifically uh, for this uh, specific arrangement. And uh, then uh, really um, after meshing, based on a maximum frequency of analysis for the acoustic pressure, um, the uh, the computation is uh, can take, take can take place, so um, this um, this process um, really you can see about that uh, um, there is quite a lot of automation in that and um, and then it really um, after solving this can really um, bring the engineer up to the uh, up to the uh, results directly, which we can really show later. Um, Alfred, do you want me to, to explain? No, I think that's that's enough. I mean, I will spend a few words maybe on post-processing results and validation, and then you can you can move forward. Um, 
think that that's fine. It was really nice. And, uh, and I think it was a good explanation what, what our technology really is. It gives you a template that you can simply fill up with your loudspeaker um, to, to, to simulate it then. Yes, I can quickly show also the, the other arrangement, which I just yeah, mentioned. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. So this was, uh, um, let's say, was solved, uh, let's say, uh, in parallel. So it's, uh, um, this is the arrangement with the vertical speaker. So this is, uh, let's say, this needs um, two channels to be uh, set up. So two speakers, they are set up um, because um, you can see that uh, the model now it's uh, uh, with the loudspeaker on, sitting on the ground on the vertical, um, let's say on the small side. So this uh, this doesn't doesn't um, it cannot be set up uh, in a way to to have a symmetry plane. So in this case, uh, two those two different uh, lamp parameter models were set, and um, and so um, this doubles the equations for the. Um, for the uh, electromagnetic coupling, um, doubles the parameters. Um, it uh, uh, doubles the um, the um, the loudspeaker channels, of course, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the shell node, the structural mechanics nodes, it uh, can take it uh, can be filled up with this uh, second channel, and then uh, after meshing, then can be brought again to uh, to computing. And uh, this needs uh, only to be, um, for example, in this model here, uh, there is a symmetry plane uh, on the uh, ZY uh, plane itself. So just, um, just some care needs to be um, taken about uh, the proper uh, boundary conditions and, uh, um, and set up for this, um, for this other model, which, um, which represent a real measurement condition which, uh, by the way, we'll show um, just in a few minutes later, we will show the, uh, the comparison to the, uh, to the measurements. Okay. All right, good. Thank you, Tomasa. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. All right, so I'm going to share my screen again. So that was the, the, the model setup and what we usually call pre-processing. You've seen lots, lots of details um, and, and, and equations in the in the console model, but actually you don't really have to deal with that. You just need to fill it up with, with your information. Um, and then we get, um, I mean, uh, also I need to mention that the, the, the so-called studies, I mean, this is really where the equation solver comes in and, and, and solves all these multi-physical equations is also optimized. So this is not, you know, plain vanilla console. This is really, you can call it a PIMP console. Uh, so not only with workflow, but also really with numerics. Um, and advancements here. So these are, are the typical results. I mean, we get um, um, most of the, the typical results that you would measure on a, on a, on a physical prototype in the, in, in the virtual domain. Um, I mean, what we are not showing here, but that's also a possibility and included in our technology is really a set of clipple measurements. So we have virtual clipple measurements um, like, um, like LPM, LSI, DIS. Um, but anyway, let's let's show here some 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 typical results, which is of course um, quite quite easy and straightforward um, to to generate. Maybe we're going to start with some electrical results. So I'm showing the total impedance here um, between the the measurement and the simulation. So throughout the graphics here, red is always the measurement and and, and blue is the the the, the simulation. Um, also, I need to mention here that um, um, it, it's it's it looks like quite a high frequency that we're simulating here, because the the upper um, frequency limit here, I mean in terms of bandwidth for practical usage, is is about 125 hertz. So you might you know, raise the question, well, why do we go up to 500 hertz? And that's that's mainly because of, of harmonics that might be introduced due to transducer nonlinearities. 
So even if you would um, apply a, um, a low pass filter um, to the voltage that goes into the, the transducer um, because of its nonlinear behavior, it would actually see the activation of, of higher frequencies. So it's really um, interesting um, um, to see what what is above the, the upper frequency limit. And usually we take about two, three um, um, octaves additionally, so um, that we can see at least second and third harmonic, which are, I think, typical enough. So I think we see a, a really nice um, 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 comparison here between measurement and, and simulation. Um, I, I think it's really up to you to judge it if it's if it's if it's good or if it's not good, but um, we did not judge it. It was done by James, and he said, "Hey, fantastic guys, <laughs> I can really work with that." So these are our, our simple point-based graphs, but I I think the essential part is also to look at the in more general the directivity behavior in all the directions um, that we would have here. I, I've just taken you one one plot here, which is a relative plot. Um, um, shows you a, a 60 degree off axis horizontal plane comparison um, normalized, by the way, between measurement and, and simulation, which I believe gives you really um, 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 a, a good impression about the accuracy of the um, of the sound gradation also in the um, in the far field, which is important. I think that's the essence here why we're gonna do this. And, and finally, I mean, we, we can show you everything that you would expect in terms of directivity. I mean, 2D um, um, directivity um, information, um, X, Y graph for um, specific um, directions here, a polar plot and a, um, um, and, and a 3D spherical representation of the, of the sound gradation. So, um, we and, and this is part of our of our software distribution is a um, uh, is a VEX license, um, so we can actually directly you know move the data from from a console model into VEX, um, which is I would say more loudspeaker. It's a loudspeakerized software, and and I I, I prefer we prefer that really instead of um, um, console post processing really go here. Um, into into X and and do more advanced post processing here. All right, then let's move over again to to Tomaso to show us the the results in three D in the software. Yes, thank you. So um, this is um, the horizontal uh, arrangement. So the last speaker position on the ground on the on the long side. Let's say. Um, Yes, just a few words uh, why this was done, because especially you can think about um, when doing uh, polars of these um, quite a massive um, enclosures. So um, it, it becomes harder to, to, to do the, uh, even a full balloon of this, uh, um, this um, quite large uh, low speaker enclosures. So, uh, one um, one the arrangement which was done here was really to uh, to have a to to get a glance about the horizontal. So the the measurements were done uh, on on the ground um, in a large um, in a large um, space. So uh, at twenty meters. So um, this was one arrangement that was speaker on the ground, and then it was uh, let's say tilted by ninety degrees on the on the other side to to get a. a to get also the the vertical um, the vertical measurements and so to to measure the uh, the vertical uh, directivity polar, so uh, in the simulation actually we are, uh, we don't have this uh, these limitations but uh, um, because uh, actually a, a full balloon can be uh, can be uh, simulated um, in in any configuration um, condition. So uh, either it uh, be a free field or a or a half space uh, condition. Um, by the way, I can show you uh, yes the um, the interface to the to the balloon uh, to the balloon calculation. So we can actually really um, having um, set, setting up a start uh, angle um, an increment and uh, and uh, an end angle uh, either for the theta and the phi angle. So. Uh, a full balloon can be uh, always uh, calculated um, quite efficiently, um, especially taking advantage of uh, um, of also of uh, the batch sweep um, calculation uh, mode, which 
uh, which offloads the calculation to multiple cores. So uh, this is, I mean, the balloon, the balloon calculation in, 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 um, in the simulation is quite, uh, is quite efficient. Uh, for this study, uh, not only a balloon was calculated, by, by, but also um, the, um, yes, the horizontal um, polars were gathered and uh, compared, as uh, Alfred just, uh, just mentioned, and I will show you um, soon. But uh, let's first uh, start with the, uh, the post-processing, typical post-processing, see, so that we have in the, in the templates, so it's, uh, it's about um, SPL plots which actually uh, cut through um, uh, it in, uh, in the near field in whichever um, in the near field in whichever uh, position of, uh, of space it can be calculated the SPL inside the let's say the closure enclosure or uh, inside the horn itself. Um, other plots is uh, the excursion um, excursion of the uh, low speaker the transducer um, the impedance yes that uh, Alfred just uh, just shown. So this is, uh, let's say, the uh, parallel um, the parallel speaker um, arrangement, um, SPL, uh, yes, on, on axis. Well, this is, was a ground, bl ground plane measurement, so it was at two meters uh, in front of the speaker. Um, so this is smoothness, which is not, um, which uh, we have developed to really to, to gather uh, the, um, the regularities on the response curve. So, this is kind of a dif differential over the, the response curve so, um, ad of adjacent frequency bins. So it really shows where the, uh, the regularities are, uh, are in, the, in the frequency. Uh, other typical plots that we have um, uh, implemented is, for example, the load unbalance, which is an indicator of, uh, let's, go, let's call it, um, to, to, to gather if there is a problem related to, to rocking. So um, in, in 3D, this looks like uh, this typical plot, which is uh, average pressure um, in front and rear of the, on the, of the cone in this annular ring, so in dB. So, uh, and, the, and the loading, the, the load unbalance, it's, uh, let's say, the uh, lumped quantity, which calculates, let's say, um, uh, opposite sides, uh, opposite sides of, on the cone of this, uh, of this loading on the pressure uh, on the cone, so it really uh, spots out uh, if there is, uh, let's say, uh, a rocking, uh, let's say, problem at some point. But uh, as we can see here in the in the horizontal uh, um, in the horizontal placement of the loudspeaker speaker for this uh, cone, there is a, a not um, not a high unbalance. So it's uh, only let's say only one dB uh, of unbalance. So it, we 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 typically say that after. Um, as long as it, it, it stays within the 3 dB limit, it's, uh, it's fine. Other typical plots which uh, can be uh, represented in COMSOL are the, yes, the polars. So, so this was uh, on the horizontal plane on the ground and the, and the vertical. Um, beam width, um, balloon plots, um, plane radiation, yes. So this, uh, this um, is a, a 15 meters uh, plane in the far field. So uh, at each frequency, uh, it's possible to visualize also the, the far field uh, pressure on the horizontal plane and, uh, and vertical plane. And, um, and all these plots actually, um, I mean, they, 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 re, uh, they rearrange as soon as uh, the balloon uh, settings, which are, uh, let's say, um, Set once in the well, uh, they are set uh, initially uh, for the uh, for the normal axis uh, uh, and, the, and the different axis. Um, they they rearrange as, as soon as um, as a different um, um, coordinate system is is chosen. Um, and then yes, and then um, and then we have all all the SPL curves from the uh, from the balloon calculation. So you can see here this massive amount of curves and they are really plotted um, right away and uh, they can be uh, really also exported uh, in a matter of few seconds by the uh, export balloon data um, uh, interface. And then finally, yes, the directivity index is also um, um, interesting to look at and uh, to look at where uh, the, the L speaker starts, uh, starts beaming uh, 
um, dependent on frequency. So um, yes, this same uh, type of uh, post-processing is, of course, is available for the uh, vertical arrangement. So uh, I quickly uh, go through it. So uh, we can also see that uh, for the different for the two loudspeakers, uh, things are somehow different because of the different loading uh, coming for the for the placement uh, source. The impedance curves look slightly different. Um, SPL, yes, this was a compared to a very near field uh, measurement. Um, yes, in this case, the load unbalance for one speaker was was different. Um, probably again due to this um, for this uh, different uh, placement of the loudspeaker on one side, with the, instead of being placed uh, straight on on the floor. Um, it's worth saying that um, we always recommend to customers that that we they use these types of things lying flat on the ground like this uh, and not upright. Um, and it's really interesting to see a few measurements there um, actually demonstrating, backing up what, what we've arrived at purely by subjective experimentation. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, also, uh, again, horizontal maps, vertical maps. But uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's move to the uh, to the Bex uh, uh, comparison, which uh, so it's uh, the the broad range of uh, comparison that we are arranged. So this was the the horizontal uh, measurement. So uh, in comparing impedance uh, and frequency response at two meters on the ground. Um, and then um, I've arranged also yes what what is um, what James was uh, mentioning uh, very uh, quite important is in this case uh, the the directivity so to to gather this uh, information from the simulation so here is the um, um, horizontal um, arrangement and uh, on top is the uh, simulation on on, on, uh, on the bottom is the measurement so at, at the same angle, so 0, 30, um, 60, and 90, so 30 degrees spaced. And this is in the vertical, uh, let's say in the vertical um, loudspeaker uh, arrangement. So we can see also that there is some differences on the response curve uh, itself, uh, changing the um, switching to this um, different um, um, loudspeaker positioning. Uh, then uh, what uh, what have been what we have been doing is to uh, let's say to to represent the normalized uh, of axis responses to let's say uh, better compare to the, um, the simulation and the measurement. So this is the horizontal, and this is the vertical. Yes, we can appreciate some let's say we can call it noise or, or some some noise in in the measurement which. Uh, okay, we can uh, we can live with with this uh, uh, within this um, let's say limit. Yeah, uh, the, these were all measured outdoors, so um, there's, yeah, there's the, plenty of extraneous noises going on. Yeah, also in the in the horizontal, but but it, it it's within uh, say two dB, probably two three dB. So, but but uh, represented uh, let's say um, one. Um, uh, one uh, on top of the other, so, so uh, comparing uh, angle to angle, so 30 degrees horizontal, 60 degrees horizontal, the, we can see that, uh, yes, the, um, the simulation, the measurement, they compare quite good. So 60 degrees, 60 degrees and 90 degrees, 120 and 150. 100, okay, 180, and then, yeah, we can switch to the vertical arrangement. So in this case, also, it's the horizontal plane of the vertical arrangement. So 30 and 60 degrees, um, um, 90, 90 degrees and 120. 150, 180, and then finally, yes, the uh, the full balloons. So here in the simulation, we we can gather really um, a fine uh, angle uh, full detail balloon. So, and uh, we can either export it to SLF or or, or do um, any sort of uh, then later uh, other uh, post processing. Okay, this is it for the full. Um, 
full comparison to the simulation and measurement. Yeah, thank you very much, Tomas. I think that um, that's quite impressive. All these 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 post processing capabilities, and this is all interactive, by the way. I mean, you can you can really move everything here um, to get more more information. I mean, um, endless information. Um, hopefully, interesting for uh, for loudspeaker engineers. Um, all right, then let's let's probably quickly draw a conclusion here. Um, I'm going to share my screen again, um, and um, um, it's really a great pleasure to have James here to draw the conclusion because he's the guy that um, would then judge the mall is useful or not so that he can really do some um, some useful development stuff here. Yeah, so um, as, you, as you've just seen, um, I, I think the, the, these, the, the results are really good. They're really very accurate as well, considering um, that this isn't this is a model of an existing speaker that we already had, not a not a project that's been designed from scratch with simulation built into it from the beginning. So, I'm sure by integrating this into into the development of a product, you could get the the results to be even more accurate um, to to the to the reality. Um, but what's most important for me is that um, it's correctly calculating um, both the resonant and the horn loading effects of the design, um, which weren't always captured in other types of modelling. Um, and it can do that with uh, with a lumped element simplified loudspeaker model, um, bidirectionally coupled to the finite elements. Which, um, if you don't have to to do a full multi physics driver simulation, then that's great because it's just going to be quicker. Um, and the, the the directivity results uh, are great as well, and um, it shows that yeah we can we can get really useful um, data out of out of modeling directivity. Um, via simulation, uh, yeah, and you've seen that, that we validated that with measurements that were all done um, outside in a field with 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 airplanes going over, and it's still it's still quite good. Um, uh, so yeah, it's been a great project to work on. Um, uh, yeah, thanks to thanks to Alfred and Envoid. So um, and you back to say some things about DMUs, I think. Yeah, thank you very much, James. Um, we're looking forward to continue our collaboration, especially for array modeling. That will be really an interesting thing. And it should be straightforward, actually, um, in an FVA, because we would just duplicate um, the single loudspeaker in an array. We need to look a little bit at the computing time, of course, here. Um, hmm. So um, let's probably um, have a, a quick Q&A session here. Um, I have seen there was a, a request here uh, asking for what about the the computing requirements? I mean, the hardware requirements in terms of CPU, um, and um, um, and memory that is that is being used. Yeah, I I, I guess Tomaso every uh, um, workstation that can handle three D CAD models would be would be capable of running this probably with a little bit more of of, of RAM. So, what is your suggestion? I mean, you've shown the the simulation time was not really long. No, no, within uh, 15 minutes. So um, yes, really, oh, and also the RAM um, RAM use, usage at this at this point for this uh, for this uh, let's say uh, limited to one speaker is uh, within uh, eight gigabyte of RAM. So it's uh, it's pretty limited at the moment. But uh, um, yes, for example, um, uh, thinking about, for uh, the the balloon calculation that uses as many cores as uh, there are available. So, um, also thinking um, uh, array wise. So then it's really um, um, having more RAM and uh, more um, more cores than can uh, speed up the calculation by offloading this uh, calculation to a, to a parallel calculation, for example. But uh, yes, for this. Uh, for a single speaker, really, um, um, I say a standard workstation works uh, pretty fine. Okay. Do we have any any other questions? I don't see any question here in the in Doesn't the Q and A window. Oh, there's one coming in. Just popped up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
<laughs> question about the Alti Automotive Audio conf Conference. <laughs> is is this replacing the AES Auto Conference? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Do you want to answer it, Barry? <laughs> well, for me, it's not a replacement. It's it it it's another interesting venture, I would say, and it, it, and it should be additionally to the AES. There's no fight between Alti and and AES. I think the more um, contributors we have for the community, the better. That's that's my thought, and and, and that is a good answer. We're, we uh, uh, we we uh, very much uh, appreciate the relationship Alti has with AES, and, and we we uh, we simply look at it in terms of, of the more ways that we can serve the community and put information out there for people, the better. Um, Alfred and, and Envoyd are, are valued members of Alti, and uh, we thought we thought that there was a. Uh, uh, a niche that we could fill with this uh, with this conference, and I was more than happy to do so. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, I hope so as well. All right, anything else? I don't see anything. All right, then I, I think you can close the session, Barry. Well, and I want to thank you, gentlemen. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. I I learned a few things. Um, but then again, I, I always learn a few things at these presentations. <laughs> Excellent. And I want to point out to everybody that our good friends at Envoid will be uh, will be exhibiting at Alti Expo in the fall. Uh, they're going to be in booth 17, so you can actually uh, come up and discuss some some issues with them uh, personally. Please go to our website. That's Alti Asoc. That's Alti A S S O C dot org for information about Alti and for information about uh, the Alti Expo. We're really excited about getting back to uh, uh, live um, interaction. I'm so used to seeing people flat pictured on a screen that I'm not sure of, uh, if I remember how to deal with people directly anymore. So we're really looking forward to this. And uh, uh, and I wanna thank the people at Envoy for their time and, and trouble in putting on this presentation. We will have a link to this uh, presentation later on and it will be posted on our website and in our next newsletter. So thank you all folks. And uh, have a great day or evening, whichever side of the world you're on. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. Thank you very much, guys. It was really a pleasure to work with you. Thanks. Take care now. Bye-bye.